Okay, so hopefully that uh, gives you a little bit of an overview of, uh, of uh, Sophia. Sometimes videos like that bring up things that people didn't know Sophia could help them with. So there may be a few surprises in there. It may be that some of you in the room are using it for all of those different uses, usages. I don't know. If I can have a quick show of hands of who is currently using Sophia in one way or another, please. Okay, most of the people in the room, so you're probably in the right place. Is there anybody who, um, who doesn't know much about Sophia? Maybe um, they've just about worked out how to spell it um, and haven't actually used it yet and are looking for uh, to, to just start that process. Okay, so we've got a few in the room as well. Okay, good. So with Sophia, Sophia's been around for quite a long time and it goes through various different versions. And it doesn't get decided by a couple of people in a smoke-filled room deciding what should be in this theoretical framework. It's not about that. Sophia is very much a practical framework and it's developed um, by people that are using Sophia and doing skills management and resource management in the real world. It's not a theoretical academic model. It's actually representing what's really happening out there. And each time that we come up to change um, Sophia and to create a new version, we're completely reliant on all of you and people around the world actually taking part in the consultation process and feeding in their ideas of what's changed, what's changed since we had the last version of Sophia. So each version should reflect the current thinking, what's currently happening. It's not to way out into the future, it's saying this is what's happening now. It is a collaborative activity. Yes, I did write some of the content in there, but it was all based on actually people putting in their ideas. Some people just, their ideas were simply, shouldn't we do something more around cyber security? And it might be as simple as that. You know, what about? Um, and that will be just the trigger as an input. Other inputs were, I think we need a brand new skill on um, digital forensics and here's three definitions for, for that skill um, and for consideration. So some of the input is very detailed, some of it's very high level. The project team is put together, um, people like myself and Simon Rhoda was involved on, on the project team, a number of people around the world and our job really, my, my job as design authority was to collate all of that information. Yes, to make a few decisions where input conflicted with other input, because occasionally you do get some conflict. So that's the process we went through. And Sophia, when we launched version 5 in, when was that, 2012? Um, we, we were saying that Sophia is used in just over 100 countries. We recently did an audit and, and, and had a look at the data to see where people, have, where people are, where they downloaded Sophia and started to use it. And I think it was 196 countries, which is why we're saying uh, nearly 200 countries. So you can see there's been quite a growth in terms of geographic spread over that time. So Sophia can be used by individuals and organisations, and those of you that are already using Sophia, you're probably are using it in a mix of, of both things. And Sophia, really, one of the main advantages is that it gives you a set of definitions of skills and it creates that common language that you can use in lots of different ways. So it's very flexible. So Sophia is not prescriptive. It doesn't describe things like uh, organisation structures. It doesn't say your organisation needs to look like this or you need to have these jobs or these roles. So because it's quite open, what, what Sophia gives you, and it's a, a popular misconception, is that Sophia actually defines roles and jobs. It doesn't. It defines skills. Those skill descriptions, of course you can use those to create job descriptions, role profiles, and a whole host of other things. But because those common building blocks are the skills, that makes it very flexible. It works in all sorts of different organisations and organisation structures whether you have a very traditional um, hierarchical or organisational model or whether you're in a more agile, freer um, uh, model where you put together temporary teams for very short activities. It equally serves both of those and everything in between of those extremes. 
it, it obviously describes those skills, the 97 skills that you heard talked about on, on the video, in one or more of the seven levels of responsibility. And often we find, because of the way the language of Sophia works, it's, it's fairly open, it's, it's very free of jargon, and therefore it works well um, whether you're in the HR department, you're in the learning and development team, or you're somebody in an IT environment as well. So individuals can use it, they can say uh, a popular use of, of Sophia is to baseline, what are my skills? How many people in the room could answer the first question on behalf of themselves? What, do you know what skills you've got? Could you easily explain what skills you have? Hands up. Okay, if I asked you on behalf of your organisation, could you describe the current skills that you have in your organisation? Do you know what skills you've got? Fewer hands, yeah. Okay, if I ask the question, do you know what skills you need? Yeah, even fewer hands. That, that's, that is not unusual. Sophia, one of, the, one of the most practical pieces of guidance that I can give you, if you can't answer those two questions, which the majority of organisations and individuals can't, you can go away tomorrow and you can actually do a, a baseline assessment, either for yourself or for your organisation, and at least answer that first question, what skills do we have? Because that's got to be the starting point for any improvement. So as an individual or an organisation, that's, that's a common starting point. So with organisations, they may decide that they need to recruit, again, using Sophia to describe the jobs um, and to uh, use Sophia to assess individuals applying for roles is really powerful. I don't know whether you get calls from agencies like I do. I, I, I regularly get, a, uh, get calls, I have one a few weeks ago. Are you interested in a first level service desk analyst role? Uh, to which my response was, have you seen my CV? Um, yeah, well you came up in our search. Uh, yeah, okay, well I know exactly why I came up in your search. It's because somewhere on a distant a copy of my CV from years ago, it said I was the global program manager for a service desk implementation. So you have matched the term service desk from my CV with service desk in first level service desk analyst in your requirement from the customer and you have phoned me. I'm the wrong person for the role, I don't have the right skills at the right levels, it's not the role for me. Sadly, in our industry, that is fairly typical of the level of intelligence that uh, is applied a lot, of, a lot of the time in recruitment. It's not all the recruiter's fault, sometimes we don't describe what we need. But if we use Sophia in that scenario, I would have never been phoned up. Because if I had expressed my skills using Sophia against the skills uh, in the job description, if we'd done a Sophia-based job description, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have been phoned up because I'm not a good match for that role. Just using Sophia in that, the, in the organisations that I've seen uh, doing that, they tend to get less churn in resources because you don't hear people <coughs> saying, you know, leaving after three months and saying, well, I'm leaving because the role wasn't what I thought it would be. You don't get organisations getting rid of people because they're saying, well, actually, you haven't got the skills that you need to do the role because they'd be much clearer about describing it in the first place. And if you use that to intelligently match the candidates with the jobs, you get better results. That can cut your costs as well. It can improve your productivity. And I'm seeing those results day, day after day with different organisations. So lots of different, different usages of Sophia, and some of those are covered in that video. Uh, if you do want to see that video again, it is on the Sophia Foundation homepage. So it's Sophia online.org so looking in, in your patch you'll find um, just to quickly overview what's what's in in the packs here um, so everybody will have this a3 chart and you'll see that the, uh, the URL is actually on the bottom of that so if you want to go to the Sophia Foundation website that's the address on the bottom of that chart so that's probably the most popular view of uh, Sophia is that list of the 97 skills at the different levels and I'm going to go into some of the changes, just a really brief overview of what, what we've done, uh, what's changed between version 5 and version 6. 
So one of the things that uh, was talked about a lot uh, in the consultation was digital. The word digital and the phrase digital skills uh, comes up a lot, but people are not always very good at describing what it really means. You know, digital compared with what, analog? Not quite. So, we, uh, so one of the big challenges was trying to work out what we meant by that, and is it actually a brand new set of skills? Or is it just a different way of describing some of the existing skills that we've got? So digital is, is important, yes, of course. Uh, we had to try and work out what it really meant. And you'll see that there are some changes in Sophia, like uh, digital marketing is a good example. Um, so it's a big area where the, where the term digital is used quite a lot. But the skills that we have within Sophia are no longer confined to an IT department. You know, this is what we used to find 10 years ago, that everybody that were, they, they would think of themselves as IT professionals and they would probably work in an IT department and it was much easier to identify. The technology supports everything now, so there are people that uh, Sophia is absolutely applicable to that would not consider themselves IT professionals in any way, shape or form. So because it's spread out a lot more, um, it, 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 that's a good thing, it's a good thing, but it's, um, it makes it more difficult to uh, identify where those skills should be in an organisation. But it's certainly, uh, it's certainly everywhere. So um, we, if we're going to do any improvement of skills, we need to know those two things. What do we have now? What do we need in the future? And then we can plan the journey from one to the other. So Sophia, um, yes, it still describes professional skills. It doesn't describe um, user level skills at a, 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 at a low level. It is, more, it is still about professional information and communications technology related skills. It can be used as a benchmark. It does cover the whole range of those digital skills. Also within, within, your, uh, within your bag, you will find uh, a moving to Sophia 6 document so that's the, the transition guide so in, in that that if you if you're already using Sophia version 5 that gives you some good information on what's changed between 5 and 6 so that's what that document's about it is a summary because we, if we documented all of the discussions that went on you would end up with a, uh, a long thesis that would the only purpose would be as a guaranteed cure for insomnia um, it would definitely send you to sleep if we took you through all of that. So we've tried to summarise it in a, a reasonable way in that document. Again, that's that quick reminding you, know, Sophia skills are not job descriptions, they're not role profiles. So what's changed between five and six? Um, the categories, I've talked about the, uh, the six different categories, so we still have six categories, but we've changed the name of five out of the six of them. So why did we do that? There are a couple, couple of different reasons. One, to be perfectly honest with you, was to break some bad habits that were around. Uh, you might remember that the, the brown category before used to be called service management. And sometimes I would hear people saying, right, I work in service management. All of my skills must come from that category. Uh, sometimes true, but not very often. So you'd sometimes got people re artificially restricting themselves to trying to find their skills from one category when actually their role included skills from multiple categories. So there was some, some of the reason for that change is just to break those habits. Categories don't have definitions. They're just useful navigation aids, that's all. You won't anywhere in Sophia find a definition for those categories. All it's there to do is to save you having a list of 97 skills as a flat list. That's all it's about. So yes, we've moved some skills around. We've moved, moved things around from one category to another. It's just, hopefully, a logical grouping. That's all categories and subcategories are about. So don't over, overthink that aspect of Sophia. So um, we still have the categories, six categories, we still have subcategories, but they are navigational aids, nothing more. Uh, the names of the categories, you'll see strategy and architecture is the one that stayed the same. Um, the pattern of the names, it's all, they're always three words, and the middle one's always and, that makes it a bit easier for some of us. Uh, <laughs> and we've moved a few things around, so uh, uh, those of you familiar with version 5, you'll, you'll be able to see the, the differences there, and again, they're, they're described in that transition document. So I won't spend too long talking about that. 
Um, I guess a couple of the key things, relationship and engagement. There was a stakeholder relationship management skill that used to be in the strategy and architectures space. And there were, there were a few things that made sense to move around because what was the difference between you know, stakeholder relationship management and supplier relationship management? Suppliers are a type of stakeholder. So there was some consolidation that, that we've, uh, uh, we've done um, and mo moving things around and grouping it together. Uh, the, the levels again, uh, the seven levels that we have in Sophia, they're exactly the same. The, the helpful words that to describe those seven levels haven't changed. That's exactly the same. The generic descriptions, which you will now also find on the back of that A3 chart. Uh, <coughs> I, I, I found out that it was just the same cost to print a double-sided A3 as it was a single-sided. So I thought, hey, let's make it a bit more useful and actually use that second side for something that, that might be helpful. So, um, so you'll find that the generic levels of responsibility, all of those seven levels are on that back as a, as a quick reference. And some of those words have changed. We've edited it down a little to try and make it a little bit more straightforward. And we've also, um, one of the key changes we've, um, we've taken out is the... Um, the, the people management aspects that sometimes got a bit complicated in the generic levels. It, I don't, it, in IT, it used to be that, that to get above a certain level in an organisation, you had to take on people management responsibility. That's become less and less true. So actually, one of the changes we've made in version 6 is to take out those people management pieces and put them into the skills. So you find in, in, in the people section, there's actually some more people management skills. And we've, so we've divorced it slightly from those generic levels. Because you quite often find some very high level um, skills and roles um, that don't necessarily have a people management aspect to them. So um, level seven, uh, you know, instead of just thinking about senior management, it's really the, that emphasis on leadership, whether it's leadership or, um, from an industry perspective or a, a particular technology speciality, the speciality or, or whatever it might be, but it's not necessarily just about management. So, um, so I talked about people management bits. We've got performance management, PEMT, which is one of the skills that you'll now find uh, uh, find within within the ninety seven. Um, so, those of you, uh, quick question: who, who knows how many skills are in version five? The sad people have just put their hands up. Yeah, so that's right. Nine, it was ninety six. Um, so it doesn't mean that the difference between version 5 and version 6 is we've just added one skill. We, ha we haven't. We actually added seven skills, um, seven brand new skills, and we've consolidated some others. Um, so the headlines are, yeah, it's 97, but it's, it's seven new ones and a <laughs> consolidation of, of, of others. Um, but there are other changes as well. You'll find some skills that have an extra description at a, at a level. So things like information security is a good example that didn't used to have a description at level seven. It does now. Um, and you see that represented in organizations when you get uh, chief information security officers, which is a popular role that you see very much. That's information security, cyber security has become uh, much more of a focus than it was when we produced version five. So um, we have uh, also an IT strategy and planning skill. Uh, those of you that have used Sophia for years will know that enterprise architecture, that STPL skill used to really cover that ground. And over different versions it's moved and we suddenly found that there was a gap. So actually we've addressed that by putting, uh, putting an IT strategy and planning skill uh, back in there. Hardware design, that was a, an interesting one. Just for some reason it just wasn't covered in the previous version of Sophia. And, and nobody had really pointed it out and somebody raised it as part of the consultation. So there's a new skill in there for hardware design. So, uh, so we've got that. Uh, let's see, yes, we won't go through that detail. So s security, um, so cybernetics, cy the word cyber um, does, didn't appear in version five at all. Doesn't mean we didn't cover that area, but actually in 2012, we weren't talking about cyber security. It was a phrase that really started being used a lot more. We did use the word cyber to describe robots, didn't we? The cybernetics and those sorts of things. But cyber security is, is a term that's become much more um, uh, prevalent since, since version five. 
So we looked at the whole of the information security and the cyber security side, and you'll, you'll notice quite a lot of changes in version 6 uh, uh, around that. Just keeping an eye on the time, make sure I don't overrun. We're we doing okay, are we? Yeah, it's still got a quarter of an hour, that's good. Um, so uh, there were some security skills where we actually uh, made some deliberate improvements, so information assurance, information security, I mentioned adding level 7 to that, and some changes around security administration. We found 10 skills in version 5 that had an explicit reference to security, um, but we also found there were 22 other skills um, that were regularly used in security related roles and jobs that didn't actually have the word security in them. That's not necessarily a problem, but some people use Sophia and they use a word search type approach to using Sophia. So if they're writing a role profile for an information security person, they might search on the term security. Now that's great, that'll bring up 10, 10 or 13 skills, but actually you could easily miss those other 20 odd. So a good example is IT governance. So of course when you're doing IT governance, you're thinking about security and probably 200 other things. But in the skill description, we don't list all of those 200 things. So there's a, there's a cautionary tale here. Don't rely on uh, simple things like word search. You really have to understand Sophia a little bit more to get the most value out of it. We did identify two brand new skills really that weren't covered sufficiently in, in version five. Um, digital forensics, so we've added a skill for that. Penetration testing. And of course we had testing in version 5 and we had information security piece but, it, but actually it seemed right to create a separate skill for penetration testing. We also have product management so that's a, again something that's become a, a little bit more distinct as a, as a, as a skill. Um, so managing a, a product or service through its life cycle. We looked at information management. We had quite a lot of input on, on information management as a topic, and there were some updates that happened there. Um, actually, a lot of the information management input came from Australia, so I was really, really pleased to see uh, that input, particularly from, uh, actually had some people from the New South Wales government, actually, that, uh, that gave some useful input on that. So information management definitely had a, a good look. We had a good look at that and made some changes to that. Uh, analytics as well, um, we, we consider big data, agile, cloud, all of the uh, uh, changes that we've made are really to try and accommodate those, but it's always a case of trying to work out whether these new terms are just transitory, fashionable terms that are going to disappear, or, or whether they actually do represent a brand new skill that we hadn't thought about before, and it's a mixed answer uh, for different areas. So we have done a bit of retirement of consolidation, we've changed a few names, uh, we've moved a few skills around. Um, we have uh, reduced the amount of times that we uh, use the word IT, actually, that's one of the changes that we have. Um, because in some of the descriptions, because of uh, me describing how I described it earlier, people don't always think about themselves as IT professionals. Sometimes the use of IT in a description didn't help. Um, it actually it, it, it discouraged people from using a skill that otherwise was a perfect fit. So we, you will see that we've reduced the amount of times we use the term IT, not because we're trying to expand the scope of Sophia at all, just to prevent people from, from uh, thinking it doesn't apply, just simply because those two letters were in there. So um, Sophia, like any framework or resource, uh, can be used well, it can be used badly. Um, the, maybe it's one of the advantages, maybe it's a disadvantage of Sophia, but Sophia doesn't tell you how to use it. It is a passive resource, it's a set of descriptions and you can decide to use it how you like. Um, the, also in your, in your bags you, you, will have a, you will have that booklet there, that is Sophia, all of the Sophia content is in that book. Um, but what we've done uh, from difference between version 5 and version 6, we've tried to at the beginning put a bit more explanation in there and give a few more examples of how people are using Sophia and hopefully you'll find those useful. You might find some things that you, you didn't know people were using Sophia for and that hopefully that'll give you a bit of guidance. So we've tried to make it a bit more, uh, a bit more helpful. Uh, we've changed the formatting, you'll, you'll see that the, the colour coding 
follows through. Instead of being in three columns, it's in one column because a lot of people use, use the PDF and they share it on a screen. And actually going from one column to the next column, it was quite difficult to navigate. So um, some people will love the change and some people will hate the change. You can't please everybody. If you don't like it, blame me, that's fine. Um, if you do find it useful, then great. Um, so we've tried to make it a little bit cleaner in terms of look, but it covers the same ground as Sophia version 5, plus a bit more explanation. So that's, that's your main book. Uh, so if you use it well, if you, if you can find more uses of Sophia, you'll get more value out of it. So hopefully those examples will, uh, will, will be helpful. Um, of course, if you need help in using Sophia, um, the, the way the Sophia Foundation works is it has a network of Sophia partners and Sophia accredited consultants around the world. Um, some of those organisations are downstairs um, and, and are happy to talk to you if, if you do need help. Um, the Sophia um, Foundation website does list them all, so if you go to that Sophia website, you will find a listing of all the partners, all the training providers, all the consultants, and also the, the organisations that build Sophia content into their tools, and there's a number of tools available to help you as well. <coughs> there's a, a, a training scheme, there is an accreditation for Sophia consultants, um, the accreditation scheme is going to be uh, extended uh, very slightly over the next couple of months and we will recognise um, Sophia practitioners as well as Sophia consultants, so you'll see that change coming through from, from the Sophia Foundation. So uh, trying to summarise, because um, there's probably quite a lot that I'm trying to fit here, here into about 40 minutes and I've got 10 minutes to go, as long as keep me on track, yeah? And if I run over the two minutes, she comes up onto the stage and whacks me around the head. Oh, you give me the time's up one. I get a warning before I get hit. Okay, that's great. Um, so so uh, to try and summarise a lot of the changes, a lot of them around digital skills, cyber security, all of those big hot topic items that have had significant change since uh, version 5. Uh, here are the seven new skills that are, uh, that are in this version. I think I've talked about most of them. I didn't talk much about sourcing. Um, so I did allude to the relationship management piece, you know, supplier relationship management and business and, and, and stakeholder relationship management. And you'll see that relationship management still appears within the, uh, uh, it's moved, it's down, down the bottom under, uh, under um, relationships and engagement in the green category. Um, some of the stuff that was specific to supplier relationship management has moved to sourcing and contracts. So there's, there's a little bit of moving of things around those two or three skills. Uh, so the retirements, you will see uh, software development process improvement has, has gone. Um, so we made some uh, amendments to system development management. We also looked very cl uh, closely at the other uh, process improvement. Um, it used to be called business process re-engineering, but it's business process improvement is uh, what it's called, BPRE, for those that are sad enough to use the four-letter skill codes, uh, like me and Simon. Is it just us, or is it other, there are other people who are sad? There are some other people, right. OK, um, so uh, you, you'll see a few, a few changes around there. Um, human factor integration, so a lot of the agile, a lot of the uh, system development stuff has driven some terminology changes in that area. Um, so you'll find that uh, a couple of the uh, changes there. Technology audit, conformance review, some uh, uh, merging of stuff there. So I think that's all fairly self-explanatory. Um, so next thing, um, Sophia. Uh, is currently available in six different languages. So English, Spanish, German, Chinese, Japanese, and Arabic. Um, so I think on the Sophia website for version five, we just had three languages. Um, during the course of, uh, uh, of the couple of years between five and six, there were some translations in, in there was a Japanese translation that was added. Um, we've added Chinese and Arabic because there's actually significant growth in those, those areas. Um, I was in China a couple of months ago training people on, on Sophia and there's good take up there. Um, and I was in uh, Saudi ab about three weeks ago as well. There's a number of large organisations starting to make use of, of Sophia um, there. So it's definitely growing even further than those 196 countries we're talking about at the moment. So uh, skills management, there's a slightly different life cycle type view that's uh, within, within the booklet. 
It's broadly the same. We're talking about acquiring skills, deploying them, assessing them, developing them, and rewarding. And there's some examples of what we mean by that within the document, so hopefully you'll find that useful. Just a, a couple of quick examples of, uh, uh, of headlines and, and use of, of SOFIA. Um, in the US Defense Threat Reduction Agency, which is the, uh, um, the part of the Department of Defense that deals with weapons and mass destruction. So uh, I, I love this headline, which is why I put it in there. SOFIA plays a role in countering weapons of mass destruction. There's a headline for you. <laughs> um, but there, there is actually a, a case study that's been approved by the US government that explains how they use it. And this is very much in line with what I'm seeing in other countries, that the whole cyber security um, thing, most, most uh, governments are reflecting on the fact that they either currently have a shortage in those skills, or if they're just about managing to keep up, they're all predicting that they're going to have a shortage by 2020. It's a massive area, and a lot of the growth in Sophia that I'm seeing, a lot of the inquiries that I hear are from people in the defence um, space. Um, and people training their, their security professionals in Sophia so that they can describe the skills that they need, whether they're trying to build those skills internally or whether they're looking to recruit them from outside. Which, whichever is the case, you still need to describe what you need. And, and Sophia does a much better job at doing that in version 6. Um, I've also seen, uh, uh, this is another example of a, uh, something I found online a few weeks ago, um, so uh, CIPS, who uh, one of the SOFIA partners uh, in, in uh, Canada, started to look at how to use SOFIA for immigration services. If you're scoring people points based on the skills that you need within a the country, then uh, it's interesting to see that actually there's a few, few um, uh, organisations around the world who are starting to use it to actually uh, check those skills for people applying for uh, to move to a particular country. It's quite an interesting uh, way of using it. I'm seeing a lot more job adverts with uh, with Sophia um, terms in them. If you, if you go to Google, or are we meant to call it Alphabet now? No, is, it, is the search engine still Google? Is it? Yeah, whichever search engine you like. Um, uh, so your your preferred search engine. If you go in there and, and type Sophia and, and jobs, you you'll find. Um, week by week more and more examples um, where actually the Sophia um, codes and the Sophia levels and skills are actually being used in job descriptions. So it's nice to see that. Um, so I've been given the five minutes to go, so I, I wanted to just uh, allow a couple of minutes of questions. So this is just my last uh, two slides. So what do you do with it now? It's all well and good that we've spent uh, the last year putting together this material, but what can you do with it? So my, uh, my suggestion is if you haven't already gone to the SOFIA website, uh, then go to the website. Um, if, if you had already registered, um, we, we have a new website, so you have to re-register. If you haven't, if you haven't uh, registered in the last four, four or five weeks, since 1st of July when we had the new website, you have to re-register. Um, that's just because we've changed website. Um, so go along, register, log on there, all, all you're giving is your name and email address, it's not, not anything more than that. Download the latest version, um, you will get PDFs <coughs> and Excel spreadsheet versions of these. Um, if you, all of the six languages that it's available in, they're all available for download on, on the Sophia website. So please do download it. Um, by registering, of course, if we do any updates, you'll, you'll be on the list then to find out about those updates as well. Um, uh, have a look on the website for the information about accreditation. It may, may apply to some people. Some people might uh, want some additional training in Sophia, and there's some accredited training courses that are regularly run in, in Australia and New Zealand and all around the world, uh, and online as well. So either accreditation or training. Uh, look at that. The, the website, you will also find that you can, uh, there's a, navig a navigable version of um, Sophia in all of the six languages on the website. So we did have a similar thing for version 5, and most people didn't know it was there. So you had a lot of people using the PDF. Well, actually, the website has, a, has all of the Sophia content on it. When you log in, you then can see all the content, and you can use that to navigate your way through. So that's, some people don't know that's there, so it's worth pointing out. Um, the licensing, there haven't been big changes in licensing since the last version. The majority of uh, people that use Sophia do so under an absolutely free um, corporate user license. 
it's only the people that use it for commercial gain, like trainers and consultants and, and people that build Sophia into their products that, uh, that pay money. Um, the Sophia Foundation is a not-for-profit organisation. It doesn't make lots of money. Uh, it, makes, it brings in enough to fund the next version of Sophia. That's all it does. Um, so uh, that's, that's really the update I wanted to leave you with. So if you can't answer those two questions, it's remarkably easy to use Sophia to help you help you do that and you can do that in, in a very short space of time okay uh, so I think we've got two minutes two minutes left yeah just give me the two, no two minutes um, so uh, I can take a couple of questions if, if there are in the two minutes then we'll eat into Simon's time but has anybody got any questions at this point no questions Simon Either I explained it all, or they need to sleep on it first. <laughs> We've got one, right. So the difference, the changes to the skills and the categories, um, the people who are on five have to go, or right. to see, is it to migrate from one to the other? Yeah, so uh, for those who didn't hear the question, how easy is it to migrate from version five to version six um, with the changes? Um, quite easy, because we, we've deliberately made it sort of evolutionary rather than <coughs> revolutionary. So um, you'll find that, um, uh, you know, it's worth looking if you've got job descriptions and role profiles that already exist. It's worth looking at the transition document just to see what's changed, and it may be that you want to add a skill or, or, or change it. But the, the changes are relatively easy to apply. I mean, probably it is a, an organisational level. It's worth making a conscious decision on when, when you're going to switch to version six because the, there are changes. Um, and I do have some organisations who've made the decision to stay with five for a couple of months because they're right in the middle of, of producing some role profiles or doing an assessment. But the majority of organisations are switching straight to six and finding it quite easy. It's not a, it's not a wholesale change. The, the reason we've stuck with that structure is to make it quite easy to, to transition. Um, One more question, yes. Yeah, yeah, we can we can make sure that, uh, that that's available. I think um, I think we can we'll either post it on the uh, Sophia.events website or put a link to it on there. I think uh, Nicole will help me help me make that happen. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely make that available. It's no problem at all. Okay, I'm, I'm out of time, so I'm going to hand over to Simon now. All right.